Please stand for the reading of God's Word. We're in Daniel 5 this morning, and we are in our series, Bold in Babylon. I'll begin with verse 22, if you're following in long. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath, and in whose are all your ways you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed, and this is the writing that was inscribed. Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him, and he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So let me ask you, what comes to mind when you think of the writing on the wall? I'll tell you what comes to my mind is my elementary school from the 1980s. I visited many elementary schools since then, and they all basically look the same. You have motivational posters on the wall, maybe some artwork from the kids. You'll see uh, tables and chairs and desks scattered around the room. You'll see bookcases off in the corner and that little cubby where the kids can put their backpacks. Maybe you'll have a goldfish or some sort of lizard out there that the kids can look at and investigate and play with. But there is one major difference, and it's found in the center of that room. You can't miss it. It is the chalkboard. Do you remember the chalkboard? Nowadays, they've been replaced by whiteboards, markers, or smart boards and computers. But the chalkboard was used by the teacher to teach letters and math. I can still see it. Maybe you can too. The white chalk on the green board. It was a place where kids would not only learn, but in recess, we would go to the board and we would play games like tic-tac-toe or hangman. And then, of course, who could ever forget the sound of the screeching of somebody's nails on the chalkboard? I mean, it can make your skin crawl, right? But the chalkboard was more, used more than just a tool for learning. It was also a tool for judgment. No joke. If a student was acting too rambunctiously, the teacher would do the horrifying writing the name of the student on the corner of the board. It was to communicate to that unruly student and also everyone else in the class that something unpleasant was coming. What was that unpleasant thing? Maybe a trip to the principal's office or even worse, your parents are going to be called. Well, that's my earliest experience of the writing on the wall. Now, the writing of the wall doesn't originate from the 1980s classroom. Rather, it originates from here in Daniel chapter 5, which tells the story about a king named Belshazzar who receives a cryptic message from God that leads to his death. Hence, the, we use the phrase, the writing on the wall, to communicate that something unpleasant will be happening soon. Now, as far as I can see it, do, there are two primary lessons for us to learn from the writing on the wall. 
The first is a warning to us all. That's right. We are to learn from Belshazzar's errors. What exactly did he do wrong that allowed him to be the very first recipient of the writing on the wall? We need to learn from him. There's a warning for us. But the second thing we are to learn is about a promise. Ironically, the writing on the wall, the story of the writing on the wall, is not just a warning, but also a promise to God's people. And I think this promise will fire you up. And let's face it, we live in a hard world, and we all could use some hope. You heard of dope dealers, where churches ought to be hope dealers. And that's what I hope to give you this morning at the end of my message some hope from this promise. But let's begin with the warning. What did Belshazzar do wrong? What mistake did he make that earned him the eternal credit of the first recipient of the writing on the wall? Well, we got to go to the very beginning in verse 1. And in verse 1, we learn that Belshazzar is the king of Babylon. Now, you need to know this. Technically, He was not the king of Babylon. His father, rather, was the king of Babylon. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. But Babylon was under siege by the Medes and the Persians, and Nebuchadnezzar saw that the city and then the nation was going to fall. So he took off running, which left his son, Belshazzar, in charge. And so now that Belshazzar is in charge, he could do whatever he wants. But what we see in Daniel 5 is that ultimately Belshazzar is a fool. You see, he decides to live out the remainder of his days in a drunken stupor. He gets so drunk that he has the brilliant idea, brilliant idea of asking the ceremonial vessels of the people of Israel to be brought in for them to drink out of like their party cups. I mean, it was Hollywood-style debauchery. The scriptures are going to get clear that he had his wives and his concubines and a thousand of his friends drinking and getting drunk. Now, here's what I want you to know. All this mirth, all this laughter, all this supposed happiness, it comes to an end. You see, the writing on the wall brings it to a screeching halt. Not the Medes, not the Persians, but the writing on the wall. And why does it come to a screeching halt? It stops because God takes sin seriously. All sin because of God's holiness and because of God's justice must come to a horrifying end. Now, I think it's easy to look at chapter 5 here and think, yes, yes, God judges unbelievers for their sins. But let's be humble for a moment. Let's look in the mirror. Let's look at ourselves. Let's look at the sin in our lives and recognize that though God may judge unbelievers for their sins, he can discipline us for our unrepentant sins. And that is the first lesson for us all. God will discipline us for unrepentant sins. Yes, God is slow to anger. Yes, God is merciful. But all sin must come to an end. And God will not allow us to continue on in our sins. And so he must discipline us for unrepentant sin. And we see this not only in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 10 The author is writing to believers, and listen to what he says, quote, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment. I know of a pastor who was addicted to pornography And he was downloading all kinds of pornography onto his computer for years. And I assume he felt bad about it, but never changed his ways, never repented of his sin. Well, he goes to church to teach a Sunday school class, and he has a PowerPoint presentation on his computer. He plugs it in, he throws up his PowerPoint, but lo and behold, to his chagrin and everyone else's surprise, what comes up is pornography for everyone to see. 
You see, God disciplines for unrepentant sin. I know another story about a pastor, true story. In my previous church, there was a man who was having an affair on his wife uh, with prostitutes. He goes to Best Buy to meet up with a prostitute to work out the details. And that's such a strange element of the story, which, you, which means it must be true, right? And while he is working out those details, he accidentally pocket dials his wife, not knowing that she hears everything. You see, God disciplines us for unrepentant sin. Never forget this scripture from Hebrews 10.31. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. God will discipline us for unrepentant sin. Are you deliberately sinning? Are you even trying to fight it? If not, the writing is on the wall. God will discipline us for our sins. And here's the horrifying reality. The consequences for our sins may be totally irreversible. Belshazzar died. There's no coming back from that. It's done. And the same is true for us if we don't repent. God takes our sins seriously. And sometimes the consequences are absolutely irreversible. So this leads me to the next question. Why didn't Belshazzar repent? I mean, his dad left. The country is being sieged. Babylon is about to fall. I mean, why didn't he seek after the Lord? Why did he not confess his sins? Why did he act so foolishly and bring the party cups from Israel's ceremonial vessels? Why did he do that? Well... The answer isn't complicated. Belshazzar did not fear the Lord. He did not fear the Lord. That's why he drank from the ceremonial vessels. That's why he acted so foolishly. If we truly feared God, we would repent. We would obey him. This is true, and we can see it in Haggai 1.12. Listen to it. I'll read it to you. The remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. Why? And the people feared the Lord. Do you see the connection there between fearing the Lord and obedience, between fearing the Lord and repentance? Belshazzar did not repent because he had no fear of the living of God. And I think we get this. We can see in our lives. You know, uh, many of us have kids, and we have friends who have kids. And when you're around kids, kids have a lot of energy. You know, they can be running around. They can drop things. They can break things. You know, they're, just, they're growing. They're learning their body. It's just part of being a kid, and that's totally okay. And we love children. But have you ever noticed that when a parent asks your child, to come here or to do something in obedience and the child ignores their parent? What is that? Well, I know what the parent will say. Oh, Timmy, he's just a leader. No, 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 no. Timmy's not a leader. See, Timmy doesn't, doesn't revere you. He is not fearful of you. And so he's his own God. He's his own parent, and he's going to do whatever he wants. And so in the same way that children who don't fear their parents are going to disobey their parents, we, Christian, can do whatever we want if we don't fear the Lord. You see, we take sin lightly, and so what we'll do is we'll manage it, not repent it. We'll coddle our sin rather than confess it. But God doesn't take our sins lightly. Now, I want to be clear here about fearing the Lord. Fearing the Lord does not mean afraid of God. Did you get that? Fearing the Lord does not mean you're afraid of God. See, in Daniel 5, uh, Belshazzar, he was afraid. We read about verse 6. It says, The king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. What's happening there? He's afraid. But Martin Luther makes an interesting insight. Listen, he says, to fear God is not merely to fall upon your knees. Even a godless man and a robber can do that. See, fearing the Lord is not simply being afraid of God. 
Fearing the Lord, rather, is having such a deep love for God and his commands that you revere him, you desire to obey him, and you will repent of sin. Another way to look at it is from Proverbs 28, 14. Listen to that. It says, blessed is the one who fears the Lord always. If you're not from a Christian tradition, blessed simply means happy. There is a happiness that comes with fearing the Lord. There's a blessedness that comes to revering God. You see, people who fear the Lord, their knees aren't knocking together. But rather, they've experienced such a joy of the Lord such a love of the Lord, that they can't help but obey him. They can't help but repent of any sins. You see, they're not afraid of God for condemnation or judgment, but they're more afraid of sin and its consequences because they have that deep love for the Lord. And so there is a wrong way to fear God, and there is a right way to fear God. A wrong way will ultimately leave you to hate God because you're going to see him as a judge. A right way to fear God only grows your love for the Lord because you understand that he was willing to send his son to die for your sins so that he could be in a relationship with you. It's that parent-child relationship. We're not afraid of God, but we have a happy fear of him. So how can we grow in this type of fear of the Lord? Right? We want to be motivated by a happy fear, but how do we grow in it? We want to be more obedient, but how can we grow in our fear? We want to repent of our sins, but how do we do that if we don't get more of this happy fear of the Lord? Well, here's what's interesting. Daniel 5 actually tells us, and it's found in the writing in the wall. And let's begin with the first way we grow in our fear. There's three of them, and I want to begin with the first way to grow in our fear of the Lord. You know, the words are written, mene, mene, tekel, parson. And what's interesting about this, and this is kind of a recent development as uh, uh, theologians and scholars have discovered, is that these words are Aramaic and they represent a sequence of weights. So mene, for a Jew, is a mina, and then uh, uh, tekel is for the Jew a shekel, and a shekel is one-sixtieth of a mina, and a parson was actually half of a shekel. And so I share that with you to say the king and his scholars who are around him and the people who are watching the writing on the wall, they didn't read that and go like, I don't know what those words, I don't know what those, those, those letters are. I don't, I don't know what they are. They knew what they are. They knew the, what the words meant on the surface, but they didn't understand them. They could read them, but they couldn't comprehend them. Now, what is the writing on the wall for us? Well, that's not too difficult. It's the Bible, right? God has given us his word. And I have found that there are many people who can read the Bible, but they don't understand it. Psalm 112.1 says, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commands. And so there is a reading that can lead or cannot lead to comprehension. And if it leads to comprehension, then what happens is you have a heart that explodes with a happy fear of the Lord. And this is why we oftentimes encourage you all to read your Bibles every day. We don't want you just to go to your Bible and check the box, but rather we want you to experience God. We want you to have greater love for the Lord because you're experiencing his love for you. We want his presence to be ushered into his life so that you get that happy fear, the fear that can say yes to obedience and no to disobedience, the fear that's able to motivate a repentance of even the darkest sin. How does it do that? Well, I have an uh, illustration. I don't think I told this here yet, so I think it's a fair, fair game. I am the youngest of three kids, and there's a decent separation between me and my siblings. And so when I was growing up, I felt at times like an only child. Now, my dad had a stressful job. And so his way of dealing with that stress was to take me and my mom to the woods in a cabin that they owned 
30 weekends a year, three, zero. Now, I was a tween, so you can imagine that as my friends are at the mall, they're going to the food courts, they're watching the movies, they're going shopping, they're hanging out together. When we saw each other on Monday, what did I do? I went to the forest, hung on my parents, played board games with them, and hit things with sticks. That was my weekend for years. Well, 16 came, and with 16 comes a driver's license and the ability to get a job. And then I went off to college and studied far away from home. And then I uh, joined a fraternity, that type of thing. You can kind of get my trajectory. I wasn't a believer at the time. But uh, when I was hanging out with my frat bros, I remember one of them coming outside from his house in the ghetto offering me some pot to smoke. And, you know, college is a time of experimentation, right? It's a time to discover yourself and discover your likes and dislikes and to try new things, you know? But I said no, which is interesting because I wasn't a Christian and I could have easily have gone around with uh, peer pressure. So that leads me to the question, why? Why didn't I say no? Well, here's why. It's because my parents hated drugs, I remember they told me so many times how much they hated drugs. They read stories to me about families who have been torn apart by drugs and how people's bodies have been uh, ruined because of drugs. And I knew that if I tried pot, just tried it once, it would displease my family. Now, I tell you that story as an analogy. You see, when you build a relationship with God, the heart of God enters inside of you. And when temptation comes to gossip or to lose your temper or to lust, you have the ability to say no to those things because you know it would displease your heavenly Father. And this is why we're encouraging you to read your Bibles so that you can understand them. So it's not just a bunch of writing on the wall, but it comes with meaning and comprehension for you. Does that make sense? The first way we grow in the fear of the Lord is by reading and understanding his word, the Bible. The second way that we grow in the fear of the Lord is that we number our days. We number our days. Daniel tells Belshazzar in verse 26 that mene means numbering your days. And so we can grow in the fear of the Lord by numbering our days. Now, I want to be clear here. Numbering our days in all culture means eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. That is not the biblical concept of numbering your days. But rather, numbering your days means recognizing that life is swift, and it's frail, it's vaporous, it's here now, it's gone tomorrow. And because it is so brief, we need to recognize that when it's all over, we are going to stand in front of God and give an account for our lives. Now, as a believer, the account we're giving to God is not for judgment, because we're believers. Jesus took the judgment, but rather it is for rewards in life. It is an account that God will look over our life and see how we used it and will reward us for what we have done. And so I share that with you because I want you to know that numbering days is able to, allow, to empower you to fear the Lord for that day of judgment. Again, a happy fear. Not one of condemnation or revenging God, but a happy fear. I uh, have this new infatuation, and I think it's because I'm getting closer to 50. And the infatuation is with learning how, when, and why people die. I know it's weird. But if there's a link on a website that says so-and-so died, I'm clicking it. And I want to have those three questions answered. How, how old were they, and why did they die? And I read a story just this week, and maybe you've read it as well, about a woman who was in her 20s, three young kids. For some reason, she was mowing the grass at an airport, and an airplane came by and clipped her. And she ended up passing away. Really sad, really tragic. Just a super sad, sad story. And I guarantee that woman did not wake up thinking that when she's off to her job that she was going to die. I guarantee that. But any of us can wake up any day and our lives be over. 
We are not guaranteed tomorrow. I'm not guaranteed it. You aren't guaranteed it. So knowing this truth causes us to number our days and recognize that if we are currently in sin, today is a day to repent. Today is the day to say, Lord, I'm going to be standing in your presence, and I want to be found righteous, not to earn your favor, but to earn the rewards that come with it. So another way that we grow in that happy fear of the Lord is by numbering our days. The third and final way that we fear the Lord is by remembering that he sees everything. By remembering that he sees everything. Tekel means that God has weighed Belshazzar and found him wanting. That's what the scripture says. He's been weighed and found wanting. God evaluates our thoughts. He evaluates our words. And he evaluates our deeds. He sees everything. You know, um, uh, we have a family computer in our, uh, one of our rooms that the kids can see, and I have a web browser on it, and on that web browser, it keeps track of the history. I think all web browsers do this. But I am able to lock it so that the history is saved. It's impossible to delete. Now, I don't do that in order to punish my kids. That's not the goal. My goal of doing that is to remind them that I see everything. And here's the deal for us. God sees everything we do. We can try hiding it from our spouse. We can hide it, hide, uh, hide it from our pastors and ministers. We can hide it from our coworkers. We can even deceive ourselves. But God sees everything. There's no incognito mode for our lives. God sees everything. And so therefore, since God sees everything, we ought to be inspired to fear him, knowing that there's nothing that's hidden, nothing that won't be brought to the light. Now, I began by telling you about the warning. And the warning, as you heard now, is those who don't fear the Lord, well, they're going to be disciplined. But I also told you there's a promise. Joe, what's the, what's the good news here? Because this is a pretty heavy sermon, and I get that. And here's the promise, that those who fear the Lord will be rewarded one day. Those who fear the Lord will be rewarded one day. Did you see that Daniel, who obviously fears the Lord, is rewarded? Look back at verse 29. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. So would those who fear the Lord, will they be rewarded with status, fame, clothing, gold, money? Is that it here? Well, not necessarily. See, Daniel couldn't care less about these things. Matter of fact, in Daniel 5, when the king promises Daniel these things, Daniel says, look, your stuff, you can give it to somebody else, you can keep it for yourself, I don't want any of it. What Daniel wanted, what he valued most in this world was justice, was justice. And that's exactly what he gets. You see, that night, the Medes and the Persians conquer Babylon. He gets his justice. Now, we need to do some contextualization here to understand how powerful this was for Daniel. See, Babylon wasn't just the greatest nation that ever existed. Rather, Babylon symbolizes everything that is contrary to God in his persecution of its people. I invite you sometime later to read Revelation 18, where you will see that Babylon represents all that is evil and all that is broken in the world. And it culminates with the fall of Babylon in Revelation 19. And what happens there in Revelation 19 is praise from God's people that they have seen justice. In order to prove this point, I want to read this one verse to you. It reads, from the people's mouths, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For his judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. You see, the reward for God's people 
is justice. And if you have ever been wronged, you know how powerful this is. For Daniel, he was uh, kidnapped from his nation. His nation actually was first destroyed, and then he was kidnapped as a young man, taken away from his family. He was most likely, theologians tell us, castrated, and was forced into serving, serving this other nation, speaking in their tongue, wearing their clothes, learning their customs. Where is his justice? And he didn't receive it immediately. The scriptures most likely tell us that he was around 81 years old before he saw it. But guess what? He saw his justice. And like I said, if you've ever been wronged, no financial reparation is going to take back that wrong. Only perfect justice. There's so many injustices happening in the world right now and to God's people. I don't know how much of this is true or how much of this is false, but I read stories about kids who are running away from their homes because they want to go through a gender transition. They escape to a sanctuary state, and when they find their kids, the state can refuse to give their kids back to their parents. And so the, the kids are being chemically castrated, sometimes physically so. I know parents who are sending their kids off to college and their kids are being indoctrinated by some agenda such that they want to have nothing to do with their parents because they believe that they're bigots or they're prejudiced in some way because of their Christian beliefs. Parents are losing their kids in our culture. I hear about kids being kidnapped and sold into sex slavery. And of course, those are just some of the things outside the church. Inside the church, you hear stories about pastors spiritually abusing their people or, or physically, sexually abusing their people. With, there's, there's no justice being done within that church. I hear about you, workers, going off to work, and you're not going through the, you know, the diversity and equity and inclusion training because it's an LGBTQ agenda mechanism to cause you to be uh, brainwashed to a degree so that you can sign your signature with your preferred pronouns. And so, therefore, you're losing out on potential raises or promotions. You're not being able to achieve the, achieve the calling that God has in your life. Where's your justice? Well, here's what the story has to tell us. Oh, it's coming. You see, 2,000 years ago, a man came who lived a perfect life. I know, it's hard to believe, but it's true. He lived a perfect life. And that man, despite that perfection, was penalized for it, went to the cross, and died a gnarly death. Why? Because that was the sacrifice necessary so that God's people can be reconciled to their Holy Father. And three days later, he did not remain in the grave. He was resurrected. Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, reigns at this moment. We can't see him, but you best believe he's alive. And he's in control. And he will return. And when he returns, he is going to judge the living and the dead. Christian, I know those injustices scare you. I know they hurt you. But here's what you need to know. Just like Daniel, you will receive your reward. And that reward won't be merely gold and clothing. It'll be justice. I want to end with this thought. It's interesting to me that we have Belshazzar as a character who did not fear the Lord, and then we have Belteshazzar, Daniel, that was Daniel's Aramaic name given to him, who does fear the Lord. Now, I'm not going to go into the definition of their names or what have you, but is it possible that the author of Daniel 5 wants us to recognize that there are two ways of living? One, which has no fear of the Lord, ends in destruction. I mean, Belshazzar is seen as a fool. That's how history knows him. But Belteshazzar, he's one of the greatest prophets of all time. He receives justice. He's rightly rewarded. So what is that for you? If you're not a believer here, this is given to you. 
to ask you, which way will you choose? Will you fear the Lord? How do you do that? What's simple? You recognize that Jesus died for your sins. That it's your sins that put him on the cross because he loves you dearly. You trust the Lord, that's what Christians say. You trust that he died for you. But the second thing you do is you follow Jesus. You follow him. That means obeying him. That means experiencing a happy fear. That's what it means to be a Christian. And you can do that this morning. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to dive in your word. A lot of content here. But Lord, I trust that you are using these words to inspire us to fear you correctly. Not afraid, but a happy fear that leads to obedience and repentance. And Lord, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. We're all going to sin in a variety of ways. But you have given us your Holy Spirit to give us freedom. Thank you for him. And I pray that after today, many people feel not guilt or condemnation. That's not the goal of the scriptures, but life and hope that as they chase hard after you, as they follow Christ and revere him, that they'll find the freedom and the rewards they want. In Christ's name I pray, amen.